Race is an issue that I believe this nation cannot afford to ignore right now. We would be making the same mistake that Reverend Wright made in his offending sermons about America. To simplify and stereotype and amplify the negative to the point that it distorts reality. The fact is that the comments that have been made and the issues that have surfaced over the last few weeks reflect the complexities of race in this country that we've never really worked through. A part of our union that we have not yet made perfect. I agree with Senator Obama. It is time for America to have a conversation about race. I can't think of another issue facing our country that is more timely or more important today than the issue of racism. I also can't think of another issue that is more artificial, manufactured, and manipulated than this whole construct called racism. You see, I've grown suspicious of the term itself and of people who use it frequently. As I'm learning, the term racism in common usage today has a sharply different meaning than what its believers say it means. And I use the word believers intentionally because as I'm gonna to try to demonstrate, the believers in racism feel that racism is all around them. It's everywhere, all the time. Yet they have a hard time coming up with any real life examples of it, or even a definition of what it is. This phenomenon, or disconnect was one reason I decided to look a little more closely into this. I mean, we have this term racism, which is used frequently by our media companies and by our own government to describe what they call the worst of human behaviors. Yet, as I'm gonna illustrate, these are behaviors that we all engage in, every one of us. Yet, only a select few are ever identified or admonished publicly for their racism. And who are the select few? Who are the officially designated practitioners of racism? People like me, the white Americans of European heritage, the largest racial group in America. And this is what I'm gonna demonstrate. This construct of racism is not an objective term. It has no concise definition. In fact, it's used too often as a tool of intimidation, like a hammer against Caucasian whites. And so for my demonstration, I'm simply going to interview some of racism's believers and look for inconsistencies. And finding believers is easy. I ran an ad in Craigslist for interview subjects under the heading of Ending Racism Now. We'll also stop at a busy street corner in downtown Denver and stop random passers-by for their opinions on the subject. From there, I think we'll be able to determine what the conventional wisdom on racism really is, glaring contradictions and all. So those are my intentions. I'm not trying to make anyone look foolish, but the conventional wisdom on racism is so convoluted today that sometimes it's unavoidable. Do you see racism in your daily life? Every day. Every day. Every day. Do I see racism in my life? Um, I see it every day. Every day. I see racism in my daily life almost every place. In my daily life. Do you see racism in your daily life? Yeah, a lot. A lot? Yes. It's still here. It's still, still here. here. It's still here. I see racism in my daily life um, pretty much Typically every day, you know. You see it every day, like if, if you walk into a company and you're the only black person there, or you're the only Asian, or the only gay person, or the only Muslim person. It's not very diverse. Do I see racism in my daily life? I do. I, I experience it in subtle ways, uh, especially because of where I live. I, I've lived in other cities where it was more overt, but being in Colorado, everything is, it's, it's like a subtle undercurrent. I moved away from Denver when I was here before because I felt that Denver was racist, but then I found out all the cities are racist. Phase one complete, racism is everywhere. 
Now I'll ask the other question. Can you tell me, in your opinion, what, what is racism? I can tell you what racism is not. Um, to me, racism is when... I don't, uh, it's so hard. Racism is when we chop ourselves into categories. Um, and I'm not sure why we do that, because when you really look at the quantum level or the basic fabric of the universe, there is no separation. You know, I am you, I am the chair, I am the wall, I am the rug, I am the rock, I am the tree, I am the grass, I am everything. My definition of racism deals with, with ignorance and lack of knowledge, lack of, uh, lack of tolerance, lack of, and putting, it's, it's as if saying, once we put a boundary, you and I can no longer communicate. Obama, um, I think that people might not vote for him because he's black and I think that it's the same thing with like sexism because people might not vote for Hillary because she's a woman. I see that as, as racism when, when you look at a person and because of what you've been taught and what you, you know from your family, what you've, what's been ingrained into your psyche, that's where your ideas of racism come from. It's the racial profiling, it's that we have so many people of color, men of color in particular in prisons. It's the disparities in um, economic class between um, different races. The police harassing the homeless people and stuff like that, well, like that could be racism too because we ain't have, making an income and stuff. But don't, don't they have to be a different race from the police for it to be racism? No, it don't. Racism could be anything like, he could, I could be racist against him per se, he could be gay and I could be straight. That's still racism. So that's racism to you? Yeah. That's what I mean by disconnects. I can't think of another word that's more common in usage today, yet so vague and even contradictory in meaning. Can anyone be blamed for being a little leery of such a flexible term? An actual definition of the term would be an important part of any conversation about race, but there isn't one. Or let me put it another way. There are hundreds of subjective, highly complex definitions, some of them paragraphs long. It seems that even our own wordsmiths are having trouble with this one. Some of the more readable definitions include this one from Wikipedia. The term usually denotes race-based prejudice, violence, discrimination, or oppression. Notice anything peculiar about that definition? Yeah? It says usually. You know, I don't want to date myself here, but I remember a time when definitions were, by definition, definite. But in definitions of the word racism today, we find words like usually. Wikipedia continues, the term can also have varying and hotly contested definitions. Does it seem rational for a word with hotly contested definitions to be so widely used, especially by our friends in the journalism industry? Here are definitions of racism from the American Heritage Dictionary and from Webster's. Within these definitions, we can see a common thread. The common thread is the belief that one race is superior to or better than another race. We'll label that as our conventional wisdom definition, and I'll get back to that in a moment. But back to the interviews. None could give me a concise definition of what racism is, yet each said they saw it in their daily lives. So this time, I'll ask for a description of any of these specific incidents, not the generalities we've all heard, but actual first-person accounts of racism. Ooh, example. Ooh, man. <laughs> example? Oh, I guess, uh... Ooh. I'll give you an example. I went to a local community college, uh library to use the computer because I haven't gotten into an apartment yet. I'm returning to, to Denver. And uh, I noticed that, that one of the guys that worked in the library, he's staring at me. He's pretending he's going to get coffee, but he's staring at me while I'm using the computer. So then when I, I leave, he, he and uh, one of the other librarians, they, they say to me, well, goodbye now. Like it, it, it gave me the impression they were saying like good riddance now. I take the light rail to school every day. And um, maybe a like black person was being loud, and my automatic thought is to think, you know, black people they're so loud, you know, or black people this or black people that, and it's wrong. And I I realize it right away, but it's just the culture that I grew up in, this white culture, and 
um, racist culture that we live in, it's just bound to get you in one way or another. For example, um, I see how my friends have to struggle, my friends who are people of color have to struggle with um, just getting through the day and dealing with the people that are in their lives or at stores who are giving them a hard time. Say you have a white person come in, they'll greet the white person and then a black person walks in and they'll get on you and ask you, is there something I can help you with? Can I find you something? Can I interest you in something? They'll pay more closer attention to the black person. Sometimes if, if I go in the store, I've seen women like snatch their purse from one side of their arm and put it on the other side and look at me with a tight face, you know, so it's kind of hilarious, you know, knowing the kind of person I am, but then to see that reaction from other people, and sometimes it hurts. I mean, when you get a hateful reaction out of people that you don't even know, you know it's racism. At least I do. I live in Lakewood. Uh, pretty, pretty white. And so when I occasionally see black people walking down the street. I don't feel any fear, or certainly not. I don't think of that. I just think, oh, there goes a black person. I mean, it's just because it's odd, because it's unusual. Um, so I think that's, in a way, a kind of racism. If I'm at work and I'm talking on the phone with someone and I'm talking with a coworker who is not black or whatever, they say, oh yes, yeah, sister, I understand what you're saying. And it's like, why would you, are you saying that to me because I'm black? Would you say that if you was talking to like an Asian person? One example is there are uh, more people, like let's take the job, job sites for instance. Okay, if you got 10 black people going for a job, I say maybe two will get considered for that job versus five white people. And that can be any job? Any job. I have a vivid recollection of being in a, in a ski lift line, teenager. And you know, people are talking back and forth. And uh, I made what I thought was a curious comment. And these, this family who was in front of me, the father turned around and looked at me. And as soon as he looked at me and realized that I wasn't li just like him, he just sort of like, his face froze, everything just, and, and then the whole family just, nobody, nobody, everybody stopped laughing because it was obviously immediately not funny. Sure, when I was a child, um, I came up to a water fountain and the teacher, I put my lips to the water fountain and the teacher said, Lane, don't do that, black people do that. So there I am, I'm a young lieutenant in the army and I just got through digging a foxhole with a black lieutenant. And we just dug really deep and it's hot and we're sweating and we're tired. And I take my canteen and I open it and I take a drink. He takes his canteen out and it's empty. Now that's a crisis. What are you gonna do? Yeah, and you look at this individual next to you who's now your comrade at arms and is gonna fight and bleed for your country with you. And you got the same blisters, but he's completely different. And you look at him and he's got much larger lips and, you, and there's a message in your head that says his lips are dirty because he might have sucked on a water fountain. What the shit is that? And you look at him and you make a decision. Right then and there you say, is he my brother in arms or is he black? Which decision did you make? I handed him my canteen and he knew because he was from South Carolina and he looked at me and he said, you want me to use the canteen cup? Because he knows. And I said, no, you're my comrade in arms. And he drunk. And he licked his lips before he drank, because his lips were dry. And he handed it back to me, and he watched me. And I looked at him, and I drank. And you swapped spit with him? In essence, we swapped spit. I mean, what are you going to do? You share a canteen, and I swap and spit. And, it, and at that moment, I realized how much racism was in there. Insidious. Well, I am from the South, and every now and then my accent will come out a little bit. And people tell you you look a little yeah. bit like Bill Clinton. Mostly black. Really? Give me an example of the type of racism you see. Um, yeah, for one, when you um, in a car accident or you are um, you go to court, you're, you're sometimes you're just overpowered because you're white, and there's no no help for a black. 
I notice it in the way people respond to me, the way they respond to my children, uh, the way they respond to my husband and I. We're, we're a mixed couple. And so when we go places, I, I notice people, I notice their response is different to us. Either they'll stare longer or they'll be overly friendly. It's as if they're trying to make themselves more comfortable with us. I date interracial. I get stares from white guys. I was at, at Adams Mark Club, nightclub, uh, not, long, not long ago, and uh, I'm out dancing, and this is white guys walking by, oh, you're a good dancer. I don't need to hear that. So, so what? I'm a good dancer. There's other good dancers, too. Then he gets out on the dance floor by himself, and he starts dancing like he's some kind of great dancer. I appara apparently trying to show me up. I don't care. And <laughs> leave me alone. I date who I want to date. Just so happens I prefer dating white women. When I think of an example of how that plays out, just look at the recent immigration debates. We want to build, you know, a fence, a wall along our border with Mexico, which has brown people in it. But we don't want to build a fence or a border to the north with our Canadian neighbors, which is mostly white people. Um, why is that? So when I asked people who said they saw racism in their daily lives to give me an example of it, two couldn't. Ooh, example. Ooh, man. <laughs> Sometimes you're just overpowered because you're white. Four automatically switch to generalities. Just getting through the day and dealing with the people that are in their lives. Let's take the job, job sites, for instance. They'll pay more closer attention to the black person. But we don't want to build a fence or a border to the north with our Canadian neighbors which is mostly white people. But the rest did. Here are their examples. I noticed that, that one of the guys that worked in the library, he's staring at me. He's pretending he's going to get coffee, but he's staring at me while I'm using the computer. So then when I, I leave, he, he and uh, one of the other librarians, they, they say to me, well, goodbye now. Like, it, it, it gave me the impression they were saying, like, good riddance now. And my automatic thought was to think, you know, black people, they're so loud. I've seen women, like, snatch their purse from one side of their arm and put it on the other side. I just think, oh, there was a black person. I'm talking to some with, with a co-worker who is not black or whatever. They say, oh, yes, yeah, sister, I understand what you're saying. The father turned around, looked at me, and as soon as he looked at me and realized that I wasn't just like him, he just sort of like, his face froze, everything just, and, and then the whole family just, nobody, nobody, everybody stopped laughing. I date interracial. I get stares from white guys. This is white guys walking by, oh, you're a good dancer. I don't need to hear that. So, so what, I'm a good dancer. There's other good dancers, too. I came up to a water fountain, and the teacher, I put my lips to the water fountain, and the teacher said, Lane, don't do that. Black people do that. I noticed their response is different to us. Either they'll stare longer, or they'll be overly friendly. These are the 15 best examples I was given. I haven't hidden any coherent examples just to help make my point. And I have to mention again that these examples are given by people of all races who claim to see racism in their daily lives. Well, I hate to have to be the one to point this out, but all of these examples of this so-called racism that permeates our nation, none of them really amount to anything. Can staring at someone really be compared with persecution? Can being overly friendly to someone really be compared with denying them employment? And when I become aware of disconnects like this, I start to look for others. What other inconsistencies are hiding behind this word, this hammer, called racism? If we go back to our conventional wisdom definition of racism, we see that a racist is someone that believes that one race is better than another. What would you say to someone that said blacks are better basketball players than whites on average? Uh, I would say that is true. Would you agree the NBA is 90% African American? Yes, I would. Why is that? Because I think that better we're black, athletes. that we're better at athletes and better stuff athletes. like that. As it is now, yeah, I would say that black men are better at basketball than, than white men. Okay. 
because, because of the results that we see. Because of the results that we see. I mean, I would hope, I thought, that if a white person has the skill of a black person, they could be on the basketball team. Um, I'm not that well acquainted with it in terms of the, the racial, how, how it's occurred that the racial makeup of basketball teams is as such as it is. I have always believed it probably had to do with their skill of the game. Well, that wasn't too hard. Most people have no problem with saying that blacks are better at basketball than whites, even though that does fit that common thread among definitions of racism. See the disconnect? So I guess it's okay to say that one race is better at something than another, as long as the one race is never white people. And if you think I'm kidding or maybe paranoid, let's see how many people would be willing to state that white people may be just as skillful in other areas as blacks are at basketball. Are black people overrepresented in basketball? Yeah, I think they are. Why? They're probably better players. Is it safe to say then that the white people might be better at human relations? No. Do I think um, um, what more white or there are areas where white people excel and it's due to their skill and that's why more white people are in those areas? That's a tough one. Um, I think it could be true, but I don't know what the areas would be. Are white men better at keeping jobs and paying bills than black men? Now that just opens up a whole bag of tricks. That, that just throws in socioeconomic status, racism, culture, everything. Now the point I'm going to notice, Tina, was that when I asked you if black men were better at basketball, you gave me a, basically a one-word answer with a couple of qualifiers. Right. If I ask if men are better holding on a job, I got three paragraphs. Right. Can you see maybe a different standard that you that you assign to blacks versus you assign to the whites? No. No? No. Even though you gave me a yes, blacks are better because of the evidence. Mm -hmm. But whites, even though the evidence shows they're better at this, we've got to we've got to back up and we've got to really mm -hmm. consider this more. Yeah. You don't call, consider that any kind of a double standard at all? No. I wouldn't call it a double standard at all. So the conventional wisdom is that it's acceptable to acknowledge the skill and ability of certain races in some areas, but no one can seem to find any areas where white people demonstrate their skill and ability. It's another one of those disconnects. I mean, who can deny it? In areas where people of color excel, we credit them for their capabilities. But how do we view areas where whites excel? we condemn them for their racism. This double standard is a clear example of how the conventional wisdom on racism has become itself a form of anti-white bigotry. And I'll demonstrate this by asking about an area where white people do well. Why is it that Caucasian students test higher on standardized tests than black students? Well, because the, the tests are made for them. The tests are made for the Caucasians? Oh, yeah. The best thing you can do in school is be white, because that's the easiest way to get through. And primarily, most people who get through school who are white don't ever learn anything. All they do is memorize the, the answers until, the, until they take the test. I would say who writes the IQ test when thinking about who scores higher. So if you have white people that are writing the tests and creating the scoring for the tests, then of course white people are going to score higher on IQ tests. I know that there's been evidence that the questions are cultured towards the white, or the, each question is uh, culturally biased towards the white culture. Most of the tests are composed and put together by non-African Americans. Well, first of all, you have to look at who wrote the tests. We don't always know. So there's, there may be cultural bias. See that? Pick an area where white people outperform others, and the conventional wisdom is that it's not due to their skill, but due to some type of white bias. This is another example of how the conventional wisdom on racism today is actually quite biased against white people. The reason whites perform well on standardized tests is because we cheat. What would you say if I told you that white people write the IQ tests, but Asians always outscore them? 
I would find that fascinating. But not, I mean, I guess not necessarily surprising. I, I think that each culture has um, its gifts and talents, and taking tests is a certain talent. I don't believe there's a possibility that there is, that our, our testing results, the grades of our children has nothing to do with racism. I think that would be, that would be naive to say. But yet, we still can't come up with an explanation of why the culturally biased test designed by whites actually favor Asians. That's true. I didn't, I didn't say that there was a method to the madness, I just said there was a madness. <laughs> you feel that the bias is, is toward whites? Mm -hmm. Towards white culture. What do you say when people say that these tests that are written by whites consistently, the highest scores are Asians? I guess I don't know that statistic. My first guess for the reasons why Asians do better and from what I've studied that um, questions tend to be culture toward, or culture towards you know, the white culture are biased towards white culture is that uh, similarities in teaching style uh, uh, that would be my probably my best guess. But even if there are similarities in teaching styles, wouldn't the whites, if they're culturally biased towards the whites, if they were culturally biased towards the whites, wouldn't the whites still be the ones exceeding? Yeah, if you look at it on face value. If, if the tests were made for white people, why is it that Asians outscore whites consistently on standardized tests? Well, first of all, Asians have 6,000 years of written Lit literate history behind them. But you said that Asian. this, no, this no. tests were made for whites. Well, they're, they're, they're made for people who think a certain way. So Asians and whites think a different way than African Americans do and Latinos? It's, no, that, no, that's, there, there are different ways of thinking. Different populations represent th those ways of thought and cultural uh, congruences different ways. But I'm trying to get back to my original point. You said that the tests were created for whites. I said that Asians outscore them. And you said the reason why is why? Well, I, I don't think we have time to cover that right now. This is the unchallenged, disconnected outlook that passes for logic in many of the mainstream of our culture today. If you ask today's believers in racism why it is that whites outscore some others on standardized tests, the most common answer will be the cultural bias theory. Now, if you're rude enough to point out that the fact that Asians have been outscoring whites for decades discredits the whole cultural bias theory, well, believers won't be bothered by pesky facts. Ask them again tomorrow the same question about why whites outscore others on standardized tests, and the answer will still be cultural bias. And this illustrates the dogmatic nature of the believers. I just can't accept this logic anymore. So I'm going to ask some more questions about racism. But what I'm looking for are more of these disconnects. Is it important for white kids to learn about black culture? Of course, of course it is. In this culture, all we learn about is European American history. Black history is taken out of education. What would you say about celebrating February's Black History Month? Is that an example of white culture? An example of white culture celebrating Black History Month? Who, celebrate, who celebrates it is my question. Doesn't the TV promote Black History Month? Doesn't the idiot box promote Black History Month? You know what Month? that is? If you don't mind me saying, that's a jerk off. It's a jerk off. Uh, black people, Hispanic people, they're forced to learn about our culture, and we're not forced to learn about their culture. And we're it's not? that. I don't think so. If 66% uh, of the, the population or the audience, TV audience, is, um, is Caucasian, um, and they don't have a, a channel that specifically emphasizes their culture. But yet, yeah, Hispanic and African Americans do. Um, that's, a, that's a really hard question. We don't, study the, we don't study the history of slavery in Africa? We do study the history of, of slavery in Africa, but we don't... It's more... We study facts and what happened. We don't learn stories.
And with all this racism that permeates our country today, I thought it would be easy for people to come up with the name of a public figure who was racist. It wasn't. Of the 50 or so people I interviewed on camera that see racism daily, none could come up with the name of a public figure that was racist. I had to offer a suggestion myself, admittedly to stimulate conversation. I would say Jesse Jackson is not um, a, a racist at all. He fights against racism, he fights for peace, he wants justice, and he tries to do what he can to bring together that justice and peace. And he wants people to be united as well. As far as, far as Reverend Jesse Jackson using racism as profit, I, you know, like I say, he's a man, a, you know, a good man, and he has done some things that you know, we probably aren't proud of, but he sticks by what he does. Do I think Jesse Jackson is a racist? I guess I don't. I guess I don't. I think he's an advocate for black people, and I was going to say his people, um, and that that's an important role, but I've never thought of him as a racist. So you said that being an advocate for his people, for black people, is a good thing? I do think that. Can you name an advocate for white people? Um, can I name an advocate for white people? Wow. Specifically for white people. Catch that? Being an advocate for one's racial group is an important role as long as one's racial group is not white people. The very idea of being an advocate for white people is offensive, mostly to those calling others racists. I got the impression on the mall, they have, they have Nicollet Mall in Minneapolis, that it's like this mall here, they want to keep black people off of the mall. There's a lot of white guys up and down 16th Street Mall that are soliciting, and that pisses me off, because I've been at one point in my life where I was penniless and didn't have anything. I never panhandled, I never begged for, for money. And that pisses me off. So I told the guy, the guy who solicited me yesterday, happened to be a white guy. If he was a black guy, I'd be pissed off too. I told him, I said, I think the welfare department is right down there. And that's another thing that pisses me off. I did everything I was supposed to do, never broke the law, always tried to work for a living, and I still get treated like a second-class citizen. I risk my life for my country. Who's treating you like a second-class citizen? Mostly white males. I do believe that our culture is racist. Who's it in benefit of? Uh, white males. White males. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned the racism. Where is yeah. the racism in this? The racism is he's paying particular close attention to me because I'm in the company. My girlfriend's white, and I'm in the company of a, uh, of a, of a white woman. This is in a dance club. Yeah. A disco. Yeah. But can you ever see a situation where African American men might try to intimidate white men in that same yeah. situation? Yeah. But not as much. Not as much. It doesn't happen as much. I've seen a lot of white. Uh, black people make white people uncomfortable. And sometimes, I don't know if it's just, if it's so much racism or s sometimes it's just that they want to get back at what they consider to be the man. One of the things that happens in America is that anything that happens to white people from another race is generally not looked upon as a hate crime. In a lot of ways, it looks as retaliation. You made me uncomfortable, you pissed my parents off, and, you know, I grew up in this country, and now it's my chance to get you back. This is more of today's conventional wisdom in our conversation. When whites mistreat people of color, it's always racism. But when whites are victims, we must step back. We have to look deeper for the root causes of said mistreatment. A glaring double standard. Are white people right to be a little afraid of blacks? I'd say yeah. Yeah? They intimidate them because now it's more uh, interracial. You know, it's kind of, I don't know. Wait, wait, wait. The Filipinos are all looking for money. <laughs> and what did you say, the other one? Like Jewish people, are they're, you know, they're cheap. I mean, everybody has like their own stereotypes. Give me some more of those. those are I don't know. I, I, I can't. Black I, people. Black people. Black people were criminals. Um, <laughs> that's a hard question. Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that one, actually. If 
I already hear someone say African Americans are committing more crimes than whites. I would not be offended because it's true. I see it on the news. Um, when you turn on the news, it's mainly an African American who intruded a home, went, did a drive-by shooting, gang-related drug bust. So that's all you see pretty much is African American crime. So no, I would not be offended, but I would, I would agree. If you're thinking of a, of a black person and the stereotype you see, you've ingrained in your head is this, you know, this person is, is maybe a criminal. Why do African Americans get the bad rep? Because we do the most crucial stuff around here. We're just like on that point where like, if we want to do something, we'll do it and not think twice about it and just go out there and do it again and again or do it even more worse than we did before. African Americans are involved in gangs, they're involved in drugs, they're involved with just the street life. If someone were to feel that blacks are more criminally inclined than whites, would they have any justification for that? Um, unfortunately, I think yes. I don't feel like I have to go through all this racism stuff because I'm African American. Now, what would you say to the guy that says, hey, you know what, African Americans commit half the crimes in this country. Of course we should look at them more carefully. Damn. I mean, we do some crime around here, but I'm not going to say we do half of the crime. Yeah, African Americans are like that, but it's not all African Americans around here doing all the crime like that. You know, there's all sorts of other ethnicities that do all that. If you were a taxpayer, I was a taxpayer. and you heard about somebody breaking into a house, how would you feel if you saw the cops beating him down? On, on some real shit, uh, I probably, I don't know. I probably try to see, try to tell them to take that to the course, because I don't see how they're going to beat somebody up. Yeah, they broke into a house. They was in the wrong doing, but at that same point, you can't just beat somebody up because they broke into a house. How about if they broke into your house? If they broke into my house, I'm, 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 I'm I'll kill the motherfuckers. Now, what would you say to the guy that says, you're making the definition of a criminal? Well, I didn't know I'm a criminal. I've been locked up since I was 11. But so, but you say the cops are racist, but yet you're saying you're a criminal. I'm a criminal, but yeah, on that same note, when we're not doing nothing, that's when they want to come up here and fuck with us. Most of the violent crimes are committed by white males. I mean, who are, who are, well, all, okay. the, who are all the mass murderers out here? They're not black people. All of the mass murderers you're saying are white? Majority of them Major are white, uh, or well, Hispanic. How about the majority of the armed robbers and the rapists? Aren't they black? No. No? I don't think so. A common debating tactic of the believers is to flat out deny facts that we all know to be true. When Martin employs this tactic, he places the burden of proof upon me, knowing full well what a distasteful job it would be researching rape statistics. This shocking fact is one of many not reported to the American public. We're bombarded with messages telling us that racism is evil. But if selecting people for discrimination based on their skin color is racism, and it's a bad thing, well, isn't selecting people for rape because of their skin color also a bad thing? In fact, isn't it a much worse thing? And that's quite another disconnect. In other words, the conventional wisdom on racism says that I should be concerned when I hear that somewhere a white person might be persecuting someone because of their skin color. I should make it my business. Yet, God forbid that I become concerned when I hear that white women are being raped because of their skin color a hundred times a day right now in America. Well, we know what happens to people concerned about those facts. They get stereotyped as haters, and their opinions have no place in the public forum. Are the contradictions starting to become visible? You mentioned, you used a term, people of color. So who are, who are not the people of color? <laughs> well, I would say white people are not people of color. So you're saying that it's impossible for a black to be racist? Yes. How many of us would keep using this word, racism, if we found out that to a good many people it can only really mean one thing, a bad white person? Have I been a racist? I like to think not, but, and I hope not.
I think that all of us growing up in this culture and in this life are a little bit racist. Am I aware of my racism? Yeah. I'm aware of my racism. Aware a lot of people I don't think are. The conflict is you don't want to be a racist because you're black. Are you a racist? No. Not at all. At least that I know. Have you ever been a racist yourself? No. Never been? N no. On a one to ten, ten being a lot, one being a little, how much racism is there in America today? I'd say about a nine. About a nine. So you feel racism is just everywhere. Yeah, I believe it is, but I mean, I haven't experienced it myself. At one point in any conversation about race, one issue must be addressed, and it is a touchy one. But the answer to this question is paramount if we want our conversation to be objective. America never was a white nation. Never. Never. It was never a white nation. If you want to get to whose country it was, it was the Native Americans. Caucasians came and took that land from them. Europeans. Europeans stole their land. Matter of fact, this isn't even their country. They came and took a country, you know, from from people that opened their arms to them with love, and they deceived them. The American Indians were oppressed and um, slaughtered in droves by the Europeans. Uh, they were here. This is this was their land. Um, I'm not sure how they got here, or. If they fought anyone? What would you say to somebody who said every founding citizen of the United States of America was white? I think, I think that's a tough one. <laughs> what would you call a nation where every single citizen was white and where immigration was restricted to white Christians? Would that be a white nation? Why does this matter? Are we a white nation any longer? Once again, because of the disconnect, because of the anti-white bias that lies within the conventional wisdom on racism. Once again, if you accept the fact that America was founded as a white nation, then you must also accept the fact that her founding principles, which separate America from all other nations, were also developed by white men, not by a multicultural rainbow. And this fact drives the believers crazy. You see, it's okay to blame whites as a race for fuzzy historical discriminations, but it's a cardinal sin to credit whites as a race with anything. Your father's forefathers came over and they did their dirty deed and took most of the land, deceived most of the people, and the rest they killed. Now this is fascinating. Paul has absolutely no problem saying to my face, rather forcefully, that my forefathers came here and did their dirty deed. Now, the fact that he's completely wrong is so easily overlooked by today's believers, and I'll get back to that in a minute. But what is telling is that Paul has absolutely no problem with assigning collective racial guilt to all white people for presumably the way the American colonists treated the Indians. Can you see the contradiction? It's acceptable today to assign collective racial guilt to all whites for the actions of a minute fraction of them hundreds of years ago. Would it be acceptable today to assign collective racial guilt to any other races, for example, to blacks, let's say, for the crimes that they themselves committed in this decade alone? Well, no, that would be racism. Get the picture? And just to clarify, I can trace my earliest ancestors here in America to the 1870s, after our Civil War. No forefather of mine ever killed an Indian or owned another human being, ever. And I'll suggest that there's a large group of white Americans just like me in that respect. We have no blood relatives that ever practiced ethnic cleansing or slavery Yet so many seek to blame us for it. They seek to blame us for crimes our forefathers never even committed, and yet excuse and ignore other racial groups where crime is rampant today. Huh? But I digress. When we talk about Europeans stealing the Indians' land, I have to ask, 
which Indians are we talking about? White people aren't the only people who killed folks for their land. They didn't fight among each other tribes? Oh, um, uh, amongst each other, yes. Did they ever try to wipe out whole other tribes? I'm pretty sure they did. The American Indians did fight amongst themselves. Did they ever commit genocide amongst themselves? Absolutely. Yeah, there were warring nations and there were peaceful nations. It wasn't an equal playing field. Um, and what, what I mean by that is so when the Indians were conflicting with each other, when the tribes were conflicting with each other, they had similar ways of fighting each other, bows and arrows, spears, fighting, rocks, you know, whatever. And then white folks came across and they had different types of technology. Do I think that Indians killed each other for land before they arrived? I believe that, yes, that the different tribes fought back and forth. Um, but it's different, and I'm trying to explain how it's different. Here's the difference. Believers apply one set of standards to whites and another set of standards to everyone else. Isn't what the Caucasians did to the Indians the same things, but the Indians did themselves? Yeah. Okay. They gave them a taste of their own medicine. Look, every racial group, ethnic group, just about any other group you can think of today has advocates. Every group that is except white people. Don't believe me? Go to any university today and count the classes and approved organizations dedicated to the advancement of specific races or ethnic groups. You'll find thousands, each dedicated to their own race, except, that is, any groups dedicated to white advocacy. There are none. And that's a major disconnect. I mean, let's break it down. Hispanics can be pro-Hispanic without being anti-anybody. Jews can be pro-Jewish without being anti-anybody. Blacks can be pro-black without being anti-anybody. But with whites, it's different. White people cannot be pro-white without being anti-everybody else. And that's a large disconnect. Can you see why I'm leery of the conventional wisdom on racism? The only positions made available to white people on the subject of our own race is indifference or supremacy. So are there consequences to all these disconnects? How would the fact that all races are allowed advocates except whites manifest itself over time? Do I think white people will become a minority? I, when I say that, I include particularly the Hispanic population. And yet I'm not, they're really, as I understand it, that's not really a race. Um, so when we talk technically race, that's wrong. It's just that they are, uh, Hispanic people are a protected class. Do I think white nationalists have a point in saying enough is enough when whites are now at 66% when our founding fathers were at 100%? I guess I don't. I, I, I don't think they have a point. I don't appreciate those organizations. But to some extent, I guess I can uh, appreciate maybe the people's sense of loss. But in fact, white folks are starting to be a minority now. You think white people like that? Yeah, but see, like, see, like, there's more Mexicans than white folks out here. Just maybe someday it just means a completely blended group of people uh, that nobody will be able to figure out what anybody is anymore. Is that a good thing? Uh, I think that's a great thing. I think um, we are yellowing America, and everybody's blending, and that you know, I think that's a good thing. That's what it is. It's so many different races and uh, races and so many different backgrounds. And it, it's a good thing, you know, something that people should accept. It's, it's not like everybody's from England or everybody's from Germany or everybody's from France. This is a melting pot. It's 2008 now, you know, it's time for change. America isn't just, you know, the stereotypical um, Caucasian family or this and that. It's, it's, it's what, a, a mixing bowl. <laughs> So let me see if I understand the position of those here illegally from Mexico. Although most belong to no one race, many unite under the banner of La Raza, or the race, 
in order to accuse Americans of racism. That just doesn't make any sense at all. In other words, if we object to the stated agenda of replacing whites as the racial majority in America with Hispanics, it's us who get called the racists, not the people who are openly and actively working to change the racial makeup of our country. Does the word racist still seem like a good word choice? Or does it appear more like a tool of oppression? Why do you think there's so many Hispanics in fast food right now? Tell me. Well, I think it's because they're, a lot of them are illegal. How do you feel about immigration from Mexico? I think if they're going to come out here and live, they got to abide by the laws. If they ain't going to abide by the laws, they might as well get out of the country. Ooh, that's a good question. I think we got enough here. And just imagine how what America is going to be 15 years from now. Oh, I can see the potential for a lot of racial tension between blacks and Latinas. We're, you're here bleeding our, our, you know, our social services, you're using our hospitals, you're using this without contributing anything to our society. They can come over here and don't even have to speak English. You know what I'm saying? If we're in their country, we would have to adapt. The people who want to come to America the people who want to come to America from Mexico, uh, my feeling is, by God, let them in, you know? Uh, absolutely. We've got some people saying that we've got to open up the door and allow more in. And no, we shouldn't. We've got other people saying that we should close the door and build a wall. Close the door and build a wall. And what's so bad about it, these Mexicans have more of an attitude. They, they look, they're more arrogant than, than what a white man is. So you say that the Mexicans are more racist than the whites? Yes. Yes, especially the ones with the big belt buckles and the reptile shoes. You know, the United States lets 250,000 immigrants come in every year. It's more than any country in the world. Correct. But you think that's not enough? We're not being generous enough? <laughs> well, I think we got too many already. We got too many? Too many. If you were the immigration czar, oh. what would you do? If you, if you could give one order, what would it be? I would send them back. All 20 million? Yeah. It comes down to uh, our rights as a as a U.S. citizen. A citizen. Um, a citizen. You're not a citizen, right? No, I'm not. Okay. If you were the president, what would you do with the 20 million illegal aliens that are here? Oh, single dose out of yours. They they they'd be gone. Oh, it, it, it would be no problem. Oh, uh, yo, yeah, they they'd be gone. Oh, oh no. Now, if I said that, I know what would happen. I'd get called a racist. So where do the believers come from? Why do so many intelligent people overlook all these disconnects on matters of race? I think I know the answer because I used to be one. Like many others, I was trained to be a believer. I remember it well the day I got my training on the subject of racism. I was in the fifth grade at one of many Jefferson Elementary schools in the Midwest. Our teachers were Mr. Lee and Mr. Dragland. One day, they announced to the class that we were going to play a game. It was called a word association game. The teacher would write a word on the board, and we were all supposed to shout out what that word made us think of. It was going to be fun. Mr. Lee began, and he wrote on the board the first word in the game. The word was white, and he pronounced it white. And we responded with words like clean and pure and honest. And as Mr. Lee was noting them on the board, we added more. Words like good and fair and bright. And then it was time for Mr. Draglin to choose the next word in the game. He wrote down the word black, but he pronounced it black. Almost angrily, he said black. And we responded with words like scary, and dark, and evil. He wrote down our answers as we tried to think of others. Words like empty or mean or dirty. And then we all got the surprise of our young lives. Our teachers were looking at the board, but then they turned to us and Mr. Lee announced, you're all racist. We were stunned. When one of the kids challenged them, he said, I'm not a racist. I remember Mr. Lee saying something pretty close to, these are you kids' words, not ours. And frankly, we're both disgusted with all of you. The game had obviously ended. The classroom was silent, except for a couple of kids quietly crying. 
and for the rest of the day, and for the first time ever, we all got the silent treatment from Mr. Lee and Mr. Dragland. They were disgusted with our racism, and I never felt more ashamed of myself. And from that moment, I swore that I would change. From that day forward, I would believe that I am, by nature, a racist. So I ask you now, what is real? I mean, if racism were a real issue, then why do public school teachers have to trick children into believing in it? It makes you wonder, what is real? Do you see race as anything other than the color of someone's skin? Um, I personally, I personally see race as the color of someone's skin. The idea of race is strictly a, uh, a social construct. Uh -huh. Oh, it's just, it's, it's just a distasteful subject altogether to be making judgments or even observations about humans regarding their, their flesh tone or their, or their body shape. Scientists have came through and proved that we are all the same. So are you suggesting then that race is more of a social construct? Oh, absolutely. So here's some more of that conventional wisdom regarding matters of race. The fact that the different races share between 90 to 98 percent of their DNA is accepted as proof that the races themselves are not real, but rather a social construct. Now, it's very rude to point out the disconnect in that logic, mainly that the sexes, men and women, actually share more common DNA than is shared between the races. Yet no reasonable authorities are labeling the sexes as a social construct. In fact, the best example of a social construct I can think of is We got to work too. Well, I mean, isn't affirmative action specifically well, no, it's for not blacks? Working. Yeah, it was affirmative action, but it ain't, it's not working the way that it's supposed to work. They, they hire a black female and say, yeah, we hired a minority and we hired a female. We got to double Kill two birds minority. with one stone. Yeah, okay. and, it, and, the, and the black men are left out in the cold. I was born female and um, have been living somewhat as a male for about 10 years. You mentioned you have a, a teenage 14 year old daughter. Son. Son, I'm sorry, I got confused. Yeah. Biological? Yes. So I gave birth to him before I transitioned. For example, a city like New Orleans or Chicago, some people will call them black cities. Mm -hmm. uh, they overwhelmingly vote for black politicians. Yeah. Is that evidence of their racism? I think they just want to see their own race come up. You said you see racism every day. Can you give me another example? Another example? Oh. I've been, because I'm, you know, I've been, I'm, oh man, I just, but really not, I'm, I really don't see it that much in this town.